I bet it would be no surprise to you if I told you that I was inspired by other YouTubers. I mean, you're probably inspired by experts in your hobbies and interests. But what if I were to tell you that these two monsters were inspired by the ghost face killer from the movie Scream and horrifically took an innocent life? The life of Cassie Jo Stodart. They even filmed the events as a vlog. This is the case of the real life Scream Killers. Our story takes place in Pocatello, a city located in the southern eastern part of the state of Idaho. Pocatello is situated in the western foothills of the Rocky Mountains and is surrounded by picturesque natural landscape. The city has a rich history that dates back to the 19th century when it was established as a railroad town. Pocatello played a significant role in expanding the railroad in the western United States and served as a major transportation hub. Pocatello is known for its diverse economy, which includes manufacturing, education, healthcare, and technology sectors. The city itself has a welcoming atmosphere, with friendly residents and a strong sense of community. But as safe as Pocatello may seem, this is where our horrifying story takes place. Welcome to Lights Out True Crime. I'm your host, Danny Alv, and if you love true crime, you have found your home because I upload videos every week and would love for you to join our family by hitting the subscribe button. Now let's get into our case. Cassie Jo Stodart was born just a few days before Christmas, on December 21st, 1989. She didn't have the typical childhood as her parents had separated when she was just a young child. And she, her sister, along with her brother, were raised by their grandparents. The grandparents were kind and open and enjoyed being among family. Now, this extended to Cassie's demeanor. She was quickly able to make friends with anyone really. I mean, she was intelligent and ambitious. She even wanted to attend college someday as she had aspirations of becoming a lawyer. Her friends and classmates described her as a genuinely good person, an excellent student, and someone who showed kindness to everyone she encountered. And her brother, he would describe her as headstrong and his role model. She was cherished at school and was surrounded by numerous friends who were delighted to be in her company. She was also an artist spending hours a week in a room listening to music and drawing. It's said that her mother still keeps several of her pieces up around the house till this day. It seems that Cassie had an adventurous and curious spirit, always yearning for new experiences and meaningful connections. She always had deep trust in people believing in their goodness. She felt safe being surrounded by the ones she loved, family and friends, but this trust that she so freely gave was misplaced in the hands of two of her friends. Hi, hey. hey, look, it's Cassie. Hey, look, I don't know. Hello, Cassie. <laughs> I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Okay, see ya. Brian Draper was born on March 21st, 1990 to Pam and Carrie Draper. Brian grew up amidst the desert landscapes of Utah and faced many challenges due to his stutter. His stutter unfortunately made him a target for bullying. These experiences planted the seeds of darkness within him from a young age. He would later describe in an interview that he would always seek others' approval and attention and because he never really fit in, he thought taking Cassie's life would give him just that. On June 14th, 1990, Tori Ademchik was born in Pocatello to Sean and Shannon Ademchik. Information about Tori's early life is actually scarce, but what we do know is that Tori and Brian first crossed paths at Pocatello High. Now, the two forged a deep bond, united by their shared passion for filmmaking. They eagerly captured every moment, hoping their skills would prove valuable someday. It was at Pocatello High where they encountered Cassie. Her magnetic personality drew people to her so effortlessly. She was kind and popular. It was really no wonder the boys felt compelled to befriend her. 
They ultimately just wanted to be part of her life. As the new school year commenced, the boys discovered another common interest. They had a disturbing fascination with replicating the murders depicted in the popular movie Scream. Specifically, they were fixated on the idea of two friends executing their unsuspecting victims. Tragically, even before Cassie's death, they openly discussed their intentions to film her murder. This chilling conversation took place while they skipped their fourth hour class. Using this time, they compiled a list of individuals they planned to kill with Cassie tragically occupying the top spot. They even stated in the video, sorry Cassie's family, she had to be the one. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry Cassie's family, but she had to be the one. We have to stick with the plan. And she's perfect. So. In the final days of August 2006, 18-year-old Joe Lucero received a phone call from Tori, who asked if he can help buy some knives. They met up with Brian, who withdrew $40 from his bank account, while Tori would likely cover the remaining five. Although they had kept their true intentions quiet around Lucero, the pair had a clear plan in mind. While they may have preferred to be recognized as amateur filmmakers, Brian and Tori were simply teenagers with a poorly shot video compilation capturing the days and lead up to Cassie's murder and its aftermath. However, these clips played a crucial role in the case and trial. The video begins with footage from September 21st showing the pair in Tori's car at night. They discuss houses they had previously visited where the intended victims were not home. They talk extensively about Cassie and Matt, even planning to lure Matt out first to kill him just to terrify Cassie. And one particularly shocking admission was, there should be no law against killing people. I know it's the wrong thing, but hell, you restrict somebody from it and they're gonna wanna do it. They also referred to the upcoming murder as fun and boasted about being more prolific than murderers like Ted Bundy, Kenneth Bianaki, and Angelo Bruno Jr., also known as the Hillside Strangler. This mindset only demonstrates how naive they were. They believed they could take the lives of their closest friends and get away with it and continue to claim more victims. On Friday, September 22nd, there were two recordings filmed at the school. The first is a brief clip by Brian as he walks through the halls, spotting Cassie at her locker and engaging her in a short conversation. He asked Cassie to greet the camera, but her response was unenthusiastic and the footage ends there, only to resume during their skipped fourth hour class. At the table, they write out their kill list, but realize the teacher is watching them. They speak in hushed tones, discussing teachers and contemplating the legacy they will leave behind. They admit that if anyone were to see this recording, it would be only because they are dead. Now among their conversation, they even mention how they have failed eight or nine times before. This refers to the amount of times that they had attempted to kill other classmates. They would run into a common problem, that their classmates were just not home or their parents would get back too quick. And despite their desire to be seen as relentless killers, they were just nothing more than timid individuals seeking attention in all the wrong ways. Terms. Where did he murders? Like, let's see, Ted Bundy, like the Hillside Strangler, no. the Zodiac Killer. Those people are more amateurs compared to what we're gonna be. On a warm night on September 22nd, 2006, Cassie and her boyfriend Matt plan to house it for her aunt and uncle. They saw it as a chance to spend time together, and Cassie was using the money she would make to save up for her first car. They invited their friends, Brian and Tori, to join them, hoping for a fun evening. After they arrived, Cassie showed them around the house, including the basement, but unbeknownst to her, Brian made sure that the basement door would stay unlocked. He did this in order to be able to enter again later. They decided to put on a movie, Kill Bill. However, before the movie ended, Brian and Tori suddenly announced that they had to leave. They had made plans to watch another movie at the local theater. They said their goodbyes and left around 10 p.m. Instead of going to the theater, Brian and Tori parked nearby and prepared themselves. They dressed in all dark clothing, gloves, and masks. 
They even had the knives they had bought earlier that day. Their excitement was evident in the recording they had just made earlier. That's when they entered the house through the unlocked basement door while Cassie and Matt were just upstairs. They tried to lure them downstairs by making loud noises, intending to instill fear before they attacked. They seemed to view the situation more as a movie than real life. However, Cassie and Matt just didn't fall for their tactics. Even when the power went out when the circuit breaker was flipped, they remained upstairs. Brian and Tori would then turn on some lights, but not all. This is when Cassie started to feel uneasy, especially when one of her dogs was fixated on the basement steps. Her boyfriend at this point would call his mother to ask if he could stay the night, but she would say no. She felt he was too young to spend the night with a girl. Matt assumed Brian and Tori were at the theater at this time, as they claimed earlier. And this is when Matt made his exit. Brian and Tori, now alone in the house, shut off the power again. Cassie still refused to go downstairs. Determined to fulfill their twisted fantasy, the boys made their way upstairs. They saw Cassie as nothing more than a means to an end, not the friend she believed them to be. Cassie was now lying on the couch in the living room. Her heart was racing after such a distressing evening. Finally, the boys reached the top of the stairs, slamming doors behind them, breaking the silence. It's just so hard to imagine the terror Cassie must have felt in that moment. The two approached her and brutally attacked her with hunting knives. She was stabbed a total of 30 times. And sadly, this is where Cassie's life came to an end. We just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I oh just killed God. Cassie. They had already planned to create an alibi by purchasing two movie tickets so they could prove that they were nowhere near when the murder took place. Tori displayed such arrogance and cruelty that he even spent the following days with Cassie's boyfriend as if nothing had happened. And let's not forget that he had even planned to kill Matt if he had stayed the night. Two days went by without any contact from Cassie and no one could have anticipated the unimaginable horrors that awaited the Contreras family when they returned home. And on September 22nd, it was Cassie's 13-year-old cousin who made the gruesome discovery. Cassie was found lying in a pool of her own blood, with approximately 30 deep cuts and stab wounds, 12 of them being fatal. Now this is where it gets interesting. The police initiated their investigation by interviewing Matt Beckham first. This is Cassie's boyfriend. Now this is customary in most investigations to start with the people that are closest to the victim. Initially, investigators suspected Matt as he seemed kind of emotionally muted when discussing the events revolving Cassie's death. Matt recounted everything that had happened that night. Brian and Tori coming by briefly and hanging out. Now this is what led investigators to question Brian and Tori next. Now on September 24th, detectives visited the Adamchik residence for the first interview. This was the first of two interviews that were conducted with Tori. He told the detectives that he and Brian went to the Whispering Cliffs residence expecting a party. But when it became clear that there was no party happening, they left to watch a movie at the theater instead. However, the strange thing was that they couldn't provide any details about the plot of the movie that they had just watched a few nights ago. Tori concluded this interview by stating that him and Brian spent the rest of the night at his house. Brian's first interview wasn't recorded because he wasn't yet in custody. He told the police that he and Tori went to see a movie at the theater. He claimed that they arrived too late for their initial movie choice, but they decided to stay and watch Pulse instead. However, he couldn't explain the plot of this movie either. This was their first red flag. How is it that two teenagers that consider themselves film connoisseurs not remember a single detail about a movie they had just claimed to watch two nights ago? This wasn't enough to charge them with anything, but it was a huge concern to detectives. On the evening of September 26th, Brian was brought in for his second interview. Despite sticking to his original story, an officer expressed his disbelief about their movie outing. This made Brian super nervous, so he retracted his original claim about going to the movies and claimed that they had spent their time breaking into cars in a parking lot instead. He stated that they had originally lied to cover up their actual crime. Suspicions continued to grow as detectives actually placed a search for vehicle break-ins in the area that night. However, 
no reports were made of any thefts in the area. This is when detectives were sent in to search Brian's home in hopes that they would find items connected to Cassie's murder. The investigators would go on to discover an empty knife sheath. He stated that the knife belonged to his friend and was likely still with him. This is when a third interrogation took place. The following day, on September 27th, Brian was accompanied by his parents. This time, Brian admitted that he and Tori unlocked the basement door. However, he insisted that their intention was only to scare Cassie. He mentioned that they had brought masks and gloves and black clothing in order to enhance the scare factor, but they had no intentions of murder. Brian believed that his friend was simply trying to frighten him, but soon realized the true nature of his actions, that Tori was planning to commit murder. He claimed he never touched Cassie, let alone stabbed her. Brian had also mentioned that Tori had threatened to kill him earlier that day. In a last ditch effort to save himself, Brian agreed to show investigators where they hid the evidence. Accompanied by his father and several investigators, Brian led them to the site in the Black Rock Canyon. I could tell you at this point that these guys did such a bad job covering the evidence, and, and I'm thankful for that because it led to them being charged and having a case against them. Um, but they found the knives. They found gloves. They found the masks. They found letters and the tape that they had recorded. Now, the note they had found, although partially burned and difficult to read, is believed to be a note shown in one of the recordings from September 22nd. Some part of the note was still legible, and they had mentioned killing both Matt and Cassie. The detectives had Tori and his parents come to Pocatello Police Station. Tori admitted that the handwriting was his on the paper, but Tori asked for an attorney, and the interview came to a halt. Tori would then have a private conversation with his father in the other room before rejoining the detectives, at which point Tori was arrested for murder. Now, despite their efforts, Tori and Brian were arrested on September 27, 2006, on charges of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Just so you all know, both Brian and Tori received life sentences for the murder of Cassie Jo Stodart. Now, this one was a this one was a hard one to take in. It goes to show the extent that some will go to to hurt you. I mean, Brian and Tori completely fabricated a friendship in order to get close to Cassie. And she went on to accept them with open arms and welcome them into her life. And I think this goes without saying, but my thoughts and prayers do go out to the Stodart family. And I hope that they can feel somewhat like they got closure knowing that Brian and Tori will be behind bars for the rest of their life. If you've made it to this point in the video, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and alert bell because it's how I know that you guys are actually enjoying my content. So until next time, stay safe, and I will see you when the lights go out. I just want to share how frustrated I am. I just recorded like the rest of the entire video and had the microphone turned off. So I checked now and I... I'm recording. It's so upsetting. Here we go.